description has started for this meeting. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to walk people through the uh, web page. That way people can navigate to our older um, tag information. So it is www.cgc.com. You go to the rates and tariffs and you can see a drop down for rates, tariffs and IRPs. Here you scroll down and there's an integrated resource plan section here um, and there's a link for Washington and there's a link for Oregon. I'll click on Washington since we're doing the Washington IRP. <clears throat> and we'll get here. And you can see that there's uh, a lot of information in here about what the IRP is. There's a stakeholder engagement document. If you're interested in reviewing that and kind of understanding the expectations from that Cascade has of itself and of the stakeholders. Um, and then there's also information on how to reach out to myself as well as the company's IRP email address um, at IRP if you're interested in reviewing older material, there are um, presentations. There's also minutes. We try to capture as much of the discussion as possible. And um, we also have the presentation. So if you're interested in just watching the presentation again or for the first time, feel free to go to these. Um, we try to get these posted onto the site as soon as possible. Um, and so this this meeting will be probably uh, posted by today um, as long as IT is available. OK, are there any questions about our web page? It also has the remaining schedule and then older IRP meetings, uh, IRPs as well. Stop sharing that and I'll start sharing the. Presentation again. OK. All right, so I'll go to the next slide. It lets me. There we go. OK, so uh, introductions again, I'm just going to introduce. I should have introduced myself at the beginning. Brian Robertson's uh, manager of supply resource planning with Cascade. Um, we're not going to go through introductions for the targeted tags, but if you do uh, hop on to. Um, under the call to ask a question, please let us know uh, your name and the company you're representing. And um, and then feel free to ask your question. Um, and then I'll ask all the presenters today. It's going to just be Jenny and myself uh, for the most part. Um, and so there shouldn't be very many introductions from the company itself. Uh, we'll go to the safety moment and then I'll do a demand and customer forecast presentation. And then throughout the presentation, feel free to to give feedback at any point. Interrupt me at any point. Um, raise your hand, put a question in the chat. Um, come off mute and just yell at me. Um, this is very informal, so please just interrupt whenever you have a question. And then at the end, I'll I'll definitely open it up for feedback. Um, if you want to wait till the end, that's great as well. And then we'll discuss next steps. So I'll turn it over to Jenny real quick for the safety moment. All right, thank you, Brian. Um, my name is Jenny DeBoer. I'm a resource planning economist for Cascade Natural Gas, and I'm just going to give a real quick safety moment. As the weather gets nicer, we're going to be outdoors a little bit more. Uh, there's people that are hunting, fishing, camping, or just generally enjoying the outdoors can also do so safely. So make sure if you are hunting, obey all laws and make yourself visible to all hunters make sure you watch your footing while you're outside at any point in time but mostly while traversing rough terrain make sure you're not stepping in any holes uh, if you're camping make sure while you if you're going to leave your campsite that your fire is completely extinguished 
uh, wear sunscreen. You don't want to get sunburned, even if it doesn't feel hot outside, or if you don't see the sun, you can still benefit from some sunscreen. Also use insect repellent to prevent insect stings and bites. And if you're using any ATV or off-roading equipment, make sure you're doing so safely. That'll be it for the outdoor safety moment. I'll toss it back to Brian. Thanks, Jenny. Okay. So I'm going to jump into the demand forecast piece. Um, just a high level overview of demand forecast. The this is the demand and customer forecast is very important um, for the company to understand its future usage. Um, this goes into a lot of things such as uh, energy efficiency. So knowing the customer base that we're going to have in the future, um, along with the usage, then we can uh, coordinate with our energy efficiency group and they can determine how much savings are out there uh, through energy efficiency programs. Um, it's also important for our upstream transportation modeling where we need to know what our usage is on a peak day. Uh, that way we can ensure that we have reliable um, transportation to get our gas similar to distribution system planning. They'll need to know what our demand forecast is um, in order to make sure that they have enough uh, capacity to serve that load um, to our customers. And then obviously there's the carbon compliance modeling. We need to have an understanding of what is out there, what our customers are going to use. That way we can ensure that we are um, seeking those those carbon compliance options to um, reduce those emissions. Uh, so here is a service boundary map. Um, this shows Cascades uh, system and how it is uh, pretty dispersed. Um, you can see we serve all the way up into the Pacific Northwest all the way down into central and eastern Oregon and it's just broken up into different areas um, along the Northwest Pipe and GTN uh, pipelines. Um, that's how we get most of our gas and this is how we end up serving our customers. Um, we use uh, seven different weather locations, um, one here in the Baker City area, one in the Pendleton area, um, here in the Yakima area, Bend area, Longview, um, over here in the Bremerton, Oquim area, and then up here in the Bellingham area. So a couple, uh, a couple things about the demand forecast. Uh, Cascade demand forecasts is developed um, over the next 20 plus years for customers and their usage. Um, including peak demand and we actually go past 20 years we, we're going out to 2050 that way we can do our decarbonization modeling uh, one of the things that we're doing for this IRP is we're consolidating some of the models up to the pipeline zone so if you recall from previous IRPs we would do it at the city gates and while that has some benefits there are some uh, tricky things about doing that. There's a lot of uh, data that is is hard to to use at that level. It also increased the number of regressions that we have to run, and we I think it was about 202 regressions. And each regression, you go in and take a look at it and make sure it's good. And it's just very burdensome and um, takes a lot of time to to look at 202 different models and update them and um, each time you update them you got to go through each of them and make sure that they're all good so we looked at going to the pipeline zone level this has reduced it down to only 57 models each um, this is because it's still at the rate schedule level as well uh, so it's 10 different pipeline zones and then the different combinations of rate schedule end up being uh, 57 different models. These models are done at the daily level. Um, so what we do is we use our pipeline data, which gives us data by each day. However, 
this the data that comes through the pipeline data is core and non corps total company. So what we have to do is we use our um, billing system to back out some of our non core customers and then we use the core allocations between the different rate schedules to allocate that daily level. Um, this is kind of the best uh, way that we can do this until we have more fixed network data and that's something that we're we're starting to look at more um, and it might be something that is available in the next um, the next IRP. So a couple of key definitions, the AIC or Akaiki information criterion is what is used to um, measure the relative quality of these models. So what we'll do is we'll model uh, several models within each pipeline um, zone and rate schedule. So for let's say zone 10 503, we'll run like seven different uh, customer forecast models. Actually, I think it's more than that. Um, there's a lot of different combinations of models that we can run and we measure the AIC. Um, similar with the use per customer, we use the AIC to measure these different models um, and they they're they're used to look at them relative to each other. And then whichever one has the best AIC is the one that we end up taking. We utilize auto regressive integrated moving average, which is a type of model that is fitted to time series data. Uh, when we do regressions using time series variables, it is common for the individuals uh, to have time series structure. Um, this could mean there's a predictable structure to the error. Then we also use Fourier terms, which is the decomposition of the time series, and it uses a uh, like sine and cosine waves, and it helps us find the seasonality of the data. If you've seen um, customer forecasts before or actual customer uh, counts, there is a, a wave where customer counts dip in the summer, um, mainly because customers are either shutting off their system because they don't need any gas in the in the summer um, and they don't want to pay the connection fee or they're um, they may be um, like uh, tourist um, locations or anything like that. We also use weather and wind. Um, HDDs or heating degree days for those that aren't familiar. What we do is we take the high and low of a day. So let's say it's 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And we use a 60 degree reference temperature, so we take 60 minus 50 and you get 10 and your HDD for that day is 10 and we build regressions based off of our HDDs. Um, generally, the higher the HDD, the higher the. Um, that's what many of the regressions show us and um, obviously the colder it is, the, the more usage we see. Um, and then similarly, wind not as dramatic as HEDs, but wind does have a slight um, relationship with usage. And so we also use wind. I'm going to pause real quick. Oh, I see a question. So I'll open it up for the question. Uh, hello, um, my name is Byron Harmon, a regulatory analyst with the Washington Utility and Transportation Commission. Um, this is more just kind of a question of curiosity. Um, I would imagine that the four-year terms would be highly covariant with e with um, HDDs. Um, is there a bit of, bit of like covariancy there? I would imagine that HDDs would also be fairly sinusoidal in their data. Yeah, and I have a slide. I have a slide, and I know we talked about this last year, and this is something that we wanted to investigate. Um, as you probably know, we had Ashton Davis on um, mm -hmm. our team last year running the models and uh, he's since left the company. And so we've had to 
take this back over and we've been doing some training on it and this is one thing that we haven't been able to get to yet um but we do plan on investigating this and looking at um the Fourier terms versus the HEDs um <clears throat> we have noticed and there's a slide further on that kind of shows when we take Fourier terms out we, it doesn't the use per customer model doesn't do a great job of capturing mm -hmm. um, the peaks and valleys and so it's definitely something that's on our list to investigate uh, we just haven't been able to um, get around to it yet yeah it seems like based on what i remember last year the four-year terms seem to provide a useful like first order approximation of like cleaning up your data so i don't have a yeah. principled objection to it um, i was just wondering like where that comes from comes out of like theoretically methodologically yeah yeah no that's definitely something we're going to look into and see if we can um figure out why the the Fourier terms does a better job of capturing that than the HEDs themselves so those who are not familiar with the uh, our software um this is a software a free software uh, environment for statistical computing um, as well as graphics. It includes oh, thousands uh, of packages. Excuse me, Brian. Oh yeah, go ahead. Um, there's a question in the chat from uh, Will uh, Girk. I think Thank you might you. want to respond to that before we keep moving. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, can you go back to the map and list the 10 proposed pipeline zones? And... Yeah, so let's go back to the map. Um, and I'll try to find a pipeline zone map that I can add to the slide deck for the one that I post on the website. But um, yeah, so we have 10 different pipeline zones. So I'll start with Oregon. There's three in Oregon, and it's kind of broken up with how these are here. We have our GTN. We have our zone. It's called Me Oregon. ME Oregon and then zone 24. And those are our Oregon ones. Then we have seven in um, in Washington. We have zone 30W that captures this, zone 30S, which capture, captures this. This is zone 26. I think zone 26 goes all the way over here. And then we have zone 10, zone 11, zone 20, and then <laughs> Walla Walla right here is zone me Oregon. Or, sorry, zone me Washington. Is that helpful, Will? Yeah, and are those just from the... Are those from Cascade or the standard on uh, the interstate pipelines and from, you know, the upstream owners? Yeah, those are standard from the the pipelines. Um, one reason why we are able to kind of consolidate is for the most part, as long as we can get um, the gas here on transportation, in this zone, we can serve all of our customers. And so that's why we've kind of consolidated it. It makes things a little bit easier on our end. Plus, it doesn't take anything away from when we model it in our Plexo system. All right, thanks, Brian. Appreciate the explanation. Yeah, no problem. OK, so yeah, our um, again, st free statistical computing software um, has a, a bunch of different packages you can use. Uh, we use probably up to 10 to 15 different packages. And what this does is it allows us to do large number of complex calculations, uh, forecasts, Monte Carlo simulations, um, and it does it in a pretty reasonable time. Um, 
I think the current model can run the entire forecast um, in several hours, two to three hours right now. Um, so that's that's pretty good. Um, if anybody has interest in the R software, please let me know and I can set up a walkthrough of the R software and the, the coding. Um, just reach out to me and let me know. So weather stations, I, I kind of talked about this a little bit, but here's another um, image of the weather locations that we use for in Washington, Bellingham, Bremerton area, Yakima, Walla Walla, Pendleton, Redmond, and Baker City. And so just a little bit of a breakdown um, of our customer base. It hasn't really changed much in recent years, um, but our core customers, and this is by customer count, uh, about 74% in Washington, 26% in Oregon. Um, core customers by class. This is for the core, obviously. Residential, 87%. Again, this is the customer count. Industrial is a quarter of a percent and commercial is 12 percent but when we look at the actual load for each of these it's a little bit of a different story so red residential is only about half commercial is about 40 percent and then industrial is about seven percent and these are again core customers and for those that are not familiar with what core means is those are the customers that Cascade goes out and purchases their gas and purchase their purchases their upstream transportation. Uh, we also have non-core customers, or sometimes you'll hear them referred as transport customers. And those will be customers who purchase their own gas, usually through a marketer. They'll also purchase their own upstream transportation, and then they use our distribution system to get the gas. And so it's a little bit of different, um, especially when we get into the resource integration piece. We will be modeling the core and non-core a little bit differently because we don't have to, um, or we don't want to plan for the transport customers upstream or their gas purchases. Um, that's a little bit of a different story in terms of carbon compliance because we are responsible for some of our transport customers' carbon compliance. Are there any questions before I go to the next slide? Okay. So this is kind of the um, the process, um, the flow chart of how we use our, or how we run our customer forecast and our UPC customer, or UPC forecast model. And so we're gonna break these down a little bit on future slides. So I'm just gonna go through these real quick. Yeah, so we'll jump to this one. And so for the inputs, what do we use? We have historical load and actual load. So I kind of talked about this before where we take the pipeline data and we use our billing system to kind of allocate the data as best as possible. It's important for us to get daily data um, when it's actually used. That way we can best align it with our HDDs. Um, <clears throat> And then we use weather data from Schneider Electric. Our customer counts, they come from our own CCNB system through ThoughtSpot. That's just a ThoughtSpot's just a data um, uh, database that uh, or data warehouse that we collect the data and can pull the data. And then we use Woods and Pool. And so actually Woods and Pool is a little bit different now. Um, it's same same source, but now we're pulling household data 
instead of population. I did a little bit of research and I think household data better reflects the number of houses where population um, can kind of vary depending on the number of people per household. Um, and so I think household is a little bit more accurate representation of the number of houses that you'll have in your service territory. Um, I have also pulled income data, which I missed adding that into our um, slide deck that I sent out, but income data has been included in our customer forecast model. And so what I take in is the average or a, a weighted average by the different counties in a zone and added their income levels to the model. Um, income is not always a statistical, um, was not always found to be statistically significant, but there were some instances where it was included. Um, and so I definitely kept it into the model. So here's the use per customer forecast. Um, so we have the um, therms per customer for the zone by class, and we have an alpha knot, which is the baseline um, where you start. The alpha one, which is the HCD, uh, and then we also have a alpha two, which is the weekend indicator. Generally on the weekends, um, in some instances, you'll have a little bit lower usage, especially for commercial and industrial businesses. Um, if they're not running on the weekend, they'll have a lot lower usage. Um, alpha three, we have the wind, so we include that. And then for this, the, new to this IRP, we have retail price. Um, and this is what the customer pays on their bill and also i forgot to add on the slide that we have lagged the retail price by a year because generally you won't see the impacts from what has happened until a future year um, and that's something that we're still going to investigate more as well uh, see if lagging it two years would be better um, but right now we start with uh, one um, and then we check for trend uh, Fourier and ARIMA, and we run this model and we look for statistical significance. If there is none, we try to remove um, remove the the data. So then I'll move to the next slide. That way you guys can see what the results look like. Um, this is from the previous IRP. Um, no, this is not. This is from this IRP. I pulled some results that we have for now. Um, Brian, it looks like Byron has a question. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Byron. No worries. Um, when the, the data that's created by this model, is it kind of like aggregating classes together? So, for example, is it, is it looking at all residential customers in a given city gate? Or are you guys able to break it down by, say, like income, like quintiles or something like that within a given city gate? Or like what, what's the kind of data that's coming out of this? Yeah, so we aggregate. We aggregate. All the customers at the gate or at the the zone by each rate schedule, so. Each customer is ran. Um, so each sorry, so each. Uh, zone. It's it's aggregated at the zone and rate schedule level. So for zone 10, 503, all the residential customers in zone 10, they're aggregated into one regression model. So if there were a like I'm imagining like into the future, let's say like, you know, 15 years into the future, if we found that say lower income customers or let's say higher income customers were more likely to or more responsive to changing price signals and they were more likely to leave service um would that change the values that would that might be at least on a theoretical value perspective the types of values that we'd expect to come out of this model 
um, like would there be a dissonance between what this model spits out, kind of looking at this kind of aggregating perspective versus actuals if we are seeing customers leave in some kind of disproportionate way? Yeah, so. So I think the way we would want to model that is we would want to separate if we wanted to look at that, we would separate these. Customers. Into different regressions, I I don't mm -hmm. think there would be enough data to run this re regression and then. From that regression, be able to pull and say, hey, this is what the lower income level looks like. What we would need to do is from the beginning. Do a low income, separate low income or different income. Qu quartiles um, and run the regression regressions that way. Now, if we did that again, what you're going to end up doing is let's say we have 57 and we break up the regressions into different quartiles, mm -hmm. let's say four income levels, you're going to end up multiplying that 57 by four and having 200 models to run. Right. Which is, yeah, I mean, that's something that we can look into. Um, right now, I don't have income level data for customers, so that would be something I would have to go out and get. I think that in someone from uh, the equity group or regulatory could let or could let me know if that's something we're collecting, um, but I believe it is. Yeah, I think that in the previous meeting we had discussed the possibility of like, you know, I think there has to be an acknowledgement that there's a lot of a like data on and unavailability out there, but also that doing more and more precise analysis is going to be kind of this multiplicative like um, work pipeline on your end. Um, and so yeah. there has to be a degree to which we, we A, we need to be able to grapple with these risks to rate payers, these instabilities. But on the other hand, we also have to control the expectations of work on your end. Um, yeah. And we discussed the possibility of doing like a, like a case study of like maybe looking at say like, one particular zone and looking at how these like positive feedback loops might work or something like that. Would it be possible to do this kind of analysis just in like one kind of zone in order to limit the workflow on your end? So that way we can kind of have like a case study of like what this might look like. Yeah, let me. Um, before I before I commit to doing that right, immediately, right. Um, <laughs> let me make sure that I can get the income data mm -hmm. and then I can look at um, so like zone 30 W I think is one of our larger areas. I will look at breaking that section up into different uh, income quartiles and then we can run regressions off that. Now I guess my question for you is would you think that should be included in the use for customer model or just the customer forecast? Or both? Well, I mean, I, I think the the I think the most dispositive or most important number is probably the customer counts. I think that that one's going to have the biggest impact on the model outcomes. Um, and so you might be right that looking at use per for, use per customer um, might not be as fruitful in terms of like understanding the risks to ratepayers. So like if I had to choose between the two, I think that the customer count I think is obviously the priority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll have to think about that a little more and maybe we can talk about it a little bit in the customer forecast piece because um, <clears throat> what our models currently do right now is we don't have very good end use data to run our customer models off of. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I've been looking into is some decompositional uh, seasonal decomposition models where what it does is it breaks out the time series data by the trend um, by the seasonal piece and then by the um, 
uh, by randomness. And what we can do, especially with the building codes, I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit. Um, the building codes are probably going to put a big hamper on the um, customer forecasts in Washington, especially or for residential and commercial. And so I'm looking at the seasonal decomposition models to incorporate into the um, for residential and commercial in Washington. Now, I don't know if I'm going to be able to tie those with different income quartiles, but I can definitely take a shot at it and see what it comes up with. I, I appreciate your open mindedness on this. Thank you. Yeah, no, definitely. Okay. So here we have uh, the use for customer forecast results. So what you can see here, um, there's a <clears throat> negative correlation with weekend. We have our baseline intercept. So this is helpful because during the summer when there's no HEDs, we usually still have a base load. Um, generally, this is your water heater or um, a stove that may be running that's run, runs all year round. Um, and then the higher peaks, that's from when your furnace is running during the the um, winter period. And then we have different HDDs and different winds based on the the month year end. Um, and then you can see here there's the price, the retail rate, and it has a negative. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the price here in a bit. Um, before that, I'm going to. So here's what ha, here's the slide I was discussing earlier about Fourier terms. Um, when we take Fourier terms out and we ran the model with just HEDs, we noticed that it was not doing a very good job of picking up the peaks and valleys. Um, and so this is why we kept Fourier terms in for the use per customer model. Um, and it's something that we're definitely going to do more research about to see if there's um, <clears throat> if there's a reason why Fourier terms are uh, better at capturing this, or if um, we need to look into our HDDs and figure out what's going on there. Um, so to jump back into the retail rates a little bit, one thing that I've noticed, and these slides are new, um, these were not part of the slide deck that was sent out. I've noticed that in some situations that retail rate has a positive correlation. And one of the big reasons why is because gas prices have generally been pretty low, um, natural gas prices. And so there really isn't, in some areas, there really isn't a great relationship with retail rates and um, pricing. Yet, I think as soon as we get some um, some carbon compliance costs in there, there may be some more uh, relationship data that we can build it off of. But in some cases, so for example, me Washington 503, there is a negative core uh, negative relationship with retail rates. But in Zone 10, there was actually a positive and. You can see here when um, retail rates go way up in the later years. Uh, <clears throat> this is where um, carbon compliance goes way up. And you can see an impact that probably doesn't make too much sense. Um, so one thing that I've done in our modeling is for ones that have a positive correlation, um, I've actually removed the uh, coefficient from the model um, just because it, it really did not make sense to have it um, if it was a positive relationship. If prices go up, generally people are not going to use as much gas. Um, the, the one thing that we'll want to keep an eye on to make sure uh, makes sense is um, the the negative relationship, we want to make sure that that makes sense as well and that it's not just randomness as, as well. Um, 
there is a difference between like correlation and causation um, and things like that. So there may be a correlation here that the statistical software finds, but it may not be a causation. So definitely something to keep an eye on. We'll keep uh, testing the, the retail rates and um, we'll keep an eye on it as we get more actual data as well. So are there any questions on that? I see, Byron, you have a hand up. Yeah, um, thanks for including that. That's a really interesting slide and really inf interesting data. Um, there's been similar data reported around like um, truck purchases. So like when gas prices are lower um, and people feel more like bullish about the economy, people are more likely to buy trucks. Um, but then, but also at the same time, like gas prices can also go up. And as long as people are still feeling bullish about things, they will still, you know, vehicle mile vehicle miles driven will still increase. So like there are these kind of like counterintuitive trends and stuff. Um, oh. Have you guys looked at other possible historical analogs? For example, like um, heating oil. Um, so like heating oil costs are considerably higher than natural gas. Um, so it might be interesting to see like if there's useful trends from heating oil that might tell us more about like what the further future looks in as like CCA or um, you know cap and invest costs start to mount or as fixed cost ratios go up. Yeah, I haven't. I did a little bit of research on that, um, mm -hmm. but I haven't really dug too much into it so yeah that's something that i'll definitely look at um and and see what we can we can do thank you what we can what information we can get from it yeah okay so customer forecast um again we have our baseline alpha knot um and then we have our coefficient for households, our coefficient for employment. Um, so employment will generally be found a statistical significant number for like commercial and industrial customers. Um, <clears throat> retail price is also in the customer forecast and then income um, is in the customer forecast as well, but it's done as a, a variable in the model and not as a, like we were talking about before, what we could also do is break the model out into different quartiles, um, income quartiles, removing the income variable and then just gathering data off of that. Um, <clears throat> we also have Fourier terms and ARIMA models as well. So what we usually do is we start with a linear model uh, and then we check uh, for collinearity. We check the, the linear model and see how good it is. Um, some of the models end up being naive models. So for example, there might be a area where we have had, let's say eight commercial customers for the last 15 years. And so the forecast is just gonna be Eight. Um, we don't anticipate adding more there. Um, we don't anticipate those customers leaving unless the unless the model, the linear model finds that they are um, that they may move based on like retail prices. So the inputs, this is how it's put together. Again, we use woods and pool data, so we got grab household data, employment data. We also have income data. Um, it's done at the county level. And then we use thought spot data to gather our actual customer counts. Um, and then we put those into. We match those up with pipeline data, so then we have customer counts at the different zones. Um, and we run the forecast that way. Are there any questions? Yeah, Byron. Yeah, I always got questions. <laughs> yeah. right, can we go back a slide uh, for a moment? Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a bit about how you guys are looking at retail price? Like, how does that how does that work in there? So the the retail price 
what we've done is we have we've put the price that the customer pays um, per therm and we match it up against historical data and we built relationships off that. And so if retail prices go up and customer counts go up, but at a slower rate, there might be a negative retail price correlation or a relationship there. Um, and so what that does is it is ran on each one. And so what we do actually for customer forecasts, now that um, I was racking my brain on it, we run all different combinations of this. So there you see that there's seven different, uh, excluding the alpha not six different things up there. We run 36 different models of all different combinations of all of these. Mm -hmm. um, what we do is we test for collinearity, and if there is any collinearity, so sometimes there will be collinearity between household and employment. Um, and so what it'll do is it'll remove those, any combination that those two are together, it'll remove those from the, the script and it won't run those. Um, but retail price, it's built in as a, um, Earth therm number, but we don't multiply it by the therms because if we do that, there's a high correlation between them, mm -hmm. between therms and re retail price. So it's just a per therm amount that is usually changed when there's a uh, rate case or a PGA um, that changes those retail prices. Um, and it's what it, it's what the number you see on the tariffs. And then for the future values, we have taken the um, customer bill impact and calculated a per customer or a per therm average amount that we put on there. So that would be what you see um, on the bill in the future. And that includes the carbon compliance costs. So if I understand you correctly, you guys are anticipate taking the customer forecast multiplying it times the use per customer, putting that into Plexos, having it perform its portfolio optimization, like selecting what resources would result, creating a customer bill impact, and then feeding that back into the retail price. Correct. Awesome, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it does end up creating a little bit of a loop um, and so there has to be some level of expectation that the that the loop has to end eventually because <laughs> we could run this and then we could pull new um, bill impacts, put it back into mm -hmm. the customer forecast, adjust the customer forecast, adjust the plexos, run the plexos, grab bill impacts. Mm -hmm. um, and so it can turn into an iterative loop that we want to be careful um, that we don't just continue doing that and again running these models uh it does take a while so um it, it would be pretty time consuming too to do it um i have a question also about the um, number of households and employment data um you noted later in the presentation that the new building codes have a have made it impractical, impractical for new residential and commercial buildings to use natural gas. Um, do you expect the coefficient or I guess the impact of increases in the number of households in your service territory or the increase in the number of employed people in your service territory to have a declining influence on future customer forecasts? Yeah, so actually, I I haven't really thought about it that way. Um, but I th that I think you bring up a good point there. So what I've done is I've just taken the um, household data, employment data from um, Woods and Pool, and I haven't adjusted it all. Um, <clears throat> but now that you bring it up that way, it could make sense to adjust those numbers to kind of flatten those numbers out and then running the models that way. 
because the number of the number of households is not going to, to decrease in our area. Um, it'll just be the number of households that Cascade can serve is going to decrease. Um, I'll, I'll definitely look into that. I haven't I had not thought about that as a an option. Um, and then are you guys considering a I'm not sure if this would quite be a variable input um, in terms of like, you know, data sets coming in, but have you guys thought about what building stock attrition is going to look like? Um, it's like right now, I imagine, you know, it's not dispositive, you know, or at least it wasn't in the previous IRP, like insofar as customer counts were continuing to increase, it wasn't dispositive on customer counts, but it seems like if we do reach a point where there is no more customer growth due to building codes, um, that the kind of background rate of building stock attrition um, would start to become dispositive or if not dispositive, at least significant in terms of like the dynamics of future customer counts. Yeah, no, we we have, um, and that's something that we'll definitely look into more, but um, I believe I reached out to Caleb and they have a building stock attrition rate built into the energy efficiency model. I think it's set at 1.4%. Um, and it's so we'll, I'll have to double check um, okay. and look. I may be, <laughs> I may be misquoting it, um, but yeah, we definitely plan on looking at that and adding it. Okay, yeah, I mean, a 1.4% um, building stock attrition is, um, if I recall from the last IRP, I think your customer growth was about what, 1.8% annually. Is that about right? Oh, I think yeah, Caleb's raised his hand. Let's let him talk. Yeah. Yeah, just jumping in about the, the housing stock attrition piece. Um, I'm agreeing with what we're talking about from the overall idea. Um, that attrition number is uh, right around 2% on average. Uh, depends on the type of the building for residential as well as commercial. Uh, if I recall, it's between like a 53 to 62 year average lifespan. So, you know, we do a decay rate of 2%. It's right around that ballpark. Um, but of course, it does fluctuate depending on assumptions and the, the type of building that we're talking about. Thanks, Caleb. Thanks, Caleb. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, just talking about like the impacts of that. Um, so, like last year, your growth was about about one point eight percent, right? So, uh, just with yeah. so with a one point four to two point to two percent um, building stock attrition, it seems like. Once we reach that point of no more customer growth, it seems like that's a f that's a lot higher than I anticipated it to be. Like in the way, like background, like you know, just like googling and stuff. You know, I'm not an expert on these things. That's a lot higher than I anticipated it to be. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have any comments beyond that. That's just that's a lot higher than I expected to be. Uh, Corey raised his hand. Yeah, Corey. Yeah, I'm just uh, backing up to the building stock attrition rate. Um, can you kind of unpack what all goes into that and what sort of um, inputs or assumptions um, are built into that rate? Um, is it only based on conversions to electric or, or what what's all built into there? Yeah, Brian, would you like me to jump in here? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, Corey, it's, it's actually a fairly complex process in my opinion. It's uh, one of the earlier phases of the conservation potential assessment that we complete. We'll actually uh, plan on doing that again this fall. Um, the, the idea is um, there's different pieces that go into that model, which ABG, Applied Energy Group, helps us to build and continually update. Um, some of the pieces come from our actual commercial um, building stock and residential stock in like our billing database. Uh, I believe a bigger piece of it is actually from NIA. It's the residential building stock assessment and commercial building stock assessment. Uh, if I recall correctly, the last one was conducted in 2017 for the CPA, but they actually just released, uh, they being NIA, just released the 2022 numbers here very recently. So I'm imagining those will be finalized and able to be incorporated into this upcoming 2025 CPA this fall, winter and spring uh, next year. Thank you. Thanks, Caleb. 
Yeah. Yeah, so we've kind of talked about these customer forecast regime changes. So um, the building codes is definitely the, the big one. Um, for those not familiar, there's building code council that they put out new rules. Um, I think generally every three years or so. Yeah, it looks 2012, 15, 2018, 2021. Um, the latest 2021 will just went into effect on March 15th, 2024. Um, and these will have very large impacts to our customer counts. Um, so you can see here what the, the council has on their chart. They're really trying to reduce um, the number of the the usage the energy use um for the the buildings new buildings um and so this next slide kind of explains it a little more you can see here in the washington state uh, building code i pulled this and essentially what it is is each new dwelling this is for residential buildings um must comply with the washington state energy code and each dwelling must meet required number of credits. For example, a small dwelling is like five, uh, I think five credits. A larger dwelling, I think is eight credits. Um, but you can see here in the table for combustion heating uh, equipment, this receives zero credit. So um, it's very impractical for a builder to put in a, um, natural gas appliance that is combusting for heat. Um, similarly, this is happening on the water heating as well. Um, and then <clears throat> I don't have the information on the commercial side of things. We are kind of in a transition period with our uh, building code specialist. Um, we had a building code specialist who just left for another position and we're looking at getting another one. Um, but from my understanding, these new building codes are going to have a very large impact on residential and commercial buildings, new buildings, new construction buildings um, uh, for, for use of natural gas. And then Oregon customer count impacts. So um, I don't know if everyone's familiar, but on the Oregon side of things, Oregon has signed with eight other states to create a nine states pledge. Joint action plan to accelerate transition to clean buildings. Um, under the MOU, these states have set a shared goal for heat pumps, electric heat pumps to meet at least 65% of residential scale heating. Um, air conditioning and water heating by 2030 and 90% by 2040. Um, one thing is though that the MOU is not legally blind, legally binding, um, but it does send a strong signal that these states have strong targets to increase heat pump and electric space and water heating. Um, and this will effectively reduce the use of natural gas. Um, so just wanted to, to make people aware of that. Um, that's something that we're keeping an eye on. It's a little tricky trying to model some of this stuff, um, especially when the usage data um, is kind of, so the, the, what Cascade has is it has appliance data, but it has appliance data for each customer. Um, and then it has total therms for that customer. And so what we can try and do is build a relationship between that um, the usage and the end use um, and try to figure out how much use is coming from each uh, appliance. But it's very, very tricky to do, and um, we've not been successful at doing that yet. So weather normals and climate change impacts. Yeah, Byron. Yeah, sorry. Uh, could we go back another slide? Yep. One more. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess I I've kept two questions about like the the building codes is like, 
Um, on the one hand, have you guys started seeing your actual customer counts, like just from like an empirical standpoint, seeing your customer counts or the rate of change changing over time? So I guess like the D customer D, DT, if you will, like the derivative of customers over time. Has that number been changing in the last year or so? Um, yeah, so I would say it is slowed down some. Um, I haven't, I think it's slowed down a little bit. Yeah. And, and part of that is, I wonder if part of it is uh, the building codes or if more people are um, concerned about the um, compliance costs on the CCA. It's it's mm -hmm. kind of hard since both of those are in place right now, um, which is causing it. But yeah, yeah that, there has been a general slow in growth um, in usage or in, in customer counts. And how does that accord with your like current like modeling around customer counts? Um, so, I mean, we take all historical data that we have, and so it would be included in building the relationship between um, all the different coefficients. I mean, I, I guess one thing that I would be worried about is um, like effectively you have pre-2023 um, like historical data. Um, and then you have like the next round of IRPs data, which is starting to be impacted in, by these building codes and by the CCA. Are you guys distinguishing between like how much priority you put on those two data sets or those two sets of time series data? Yeah, so that that's kind of what I was talking about with the decomposition, the seasonal decomposition. Mm -hmm. And so what the seasonal decomposition does is it can break out the model by trend and by seasonality and what i anticipate we'll do be doing with this is taking the seasonality piece of that and then applying um the building stock attrition rate to it and what the seasonality piece does is it doesn't have a trend um and so it'll be zero growth it'll be a flat line out to the future um and this is in order to show the the building code changes okay um one thing that one thing that we may want to discuss is running kind of a um higher growth scenario where we could use that previous data um because there's always the risk that these building codes get overturned, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And so we may want to look at, you know, like two, three years down the road, a scenario where growth starts going back up for, for Cascade. Um, and so that's something that we'll want to consider. But yeah, that, that you'll, once I have, um, once I'm able to put more, um, I'm very close to finalizing some of this stuff. Um, I want to take more a bigger look into this decomposition, but you'll definitely see a flatter to declining growth in customer counts. I think there might be a little bit of growth um, because my understanding of building codes is that as long as you have, um, I can't even remember what it's called. Um, but as long as you like have the paperwork done to construct, I think builders can still put natural gas in um, for a little bit after March 15th, but I'm not 100% sure on that. So it sounds like you're expecting like a, a time lag in building a bit. builders respond. OK, um, Kathleen bit, has her yeah. hand raised, so I'd like to let her talk before yeah. I keep asking more questions. Yeah, hey, this is Kathleen with Engineering Services. I was going to add in that we're we're like monitoring, you know, what we're seeing with the building codes. I know um, I've been approving some subdivisions, 
and they're still going natural gas even though they can't do space or water heat but they are doing um stove like barbecue and then like decorative fireplaces is what I've kind of been seeing so at some point that might affect like our usage per customer too so another way to kind of incorporate these building codes that we're looking at from an engineering perspective um you know is when they went in effect maybe your usage per customer is going to be different because you know anyone without space or water heat you know they're not going to have the same demand or the same demand profile potentially because I don't know if you're on your barbecue at 6 a.m. I'm, I'm not, so it might look different. So those are just things we're considering and what we've been kind of like actively seeing um, early 2024. That's what I had. Um, Thanks, yeah. yeah, thank you for that. Um, another question that I have is, um, I can appreciate the distinction between a mandate and a goal. Um, does Cascade have any reason to believe the State Building Code Council isn't pursuing the zero fossil fuel emission goal with the same directness, vigor, elan, whatever term you want to use, um, that they are pursuing the mandate? I don't. Um... But that's not, I'm not able to speak for the entire company there. Uh, we may have, if if we still had our building codes uh, expert on, he may have some thoughts on that. But as of right now, I don't. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to jump into weather normals and climate change impacts. So, <clears throat> um, weather normals and climate change impact. So, what we've done um, previously is we've used a 30 year historical for and calculated using um, average HCDs. We may consider utilizing a shorter period. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to jump to that third bullet point real quick because I think that is oh and I guess second one is we used um the RCP 4.5 last year uh for climate change but this year what we've done is we've contracted with ICF and what they are going to do is they're going to provide us with projections for that represent daily HED time series data um these are going to be using the uh, coupled model intercomparison project phase six CMIP six. That's the the new climate model that I think a lot of um, people use to create their different uh, climate models. Um, what we are going to be doing is we're going to use a the SSP or shared socioeconomic pathways 2.2-4.5 and 3-7.0 which represent heavily mitigated and largely um, unabated emissions. And these um, will also include uh, <clears throat> data to help facilitate Monte Carlo sampling. Um, and then ICF will also review our cold weather um, for peak forecasts. So they'll they'll kind of, They'll look at different studies and kind of give us feedback if the climate change is going to impact um, our peak numbers. And if it does impact our peak numbers, which which way is it going to impact it? Because there's um, there's some thoughts that with warmer weather, peak days are eventually going to decline. Um, but then there's some arguments out there that climate change has actually created more volatile weather so peak day could all actually increase or stay the same and so they're going to review that and um, provide some narrative on that pause and open it up for questions real quick uh yeah byron here again uh could you go back a slide mm-hmm 
Sorry, I feel like I'm just like asking all the questions today. Um, I guess one of the things that I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about climate change is, you know, between, you know, we can say a hot, hotter future and a colder future. It seems like both of them kind of impose different risks on Cascade. Um, a colder future, so that is a lower RCP, so, you know, like RCP 2.0 or 4.5, um, imposes harder HDDs or more HDDs on aggregate per year. And that seems to expose your customers more to um, cap and invest price pressures. Price pressures. So that is, there's a larger kind of thumb on the scale in terms of customers responding to price signals um, in a colder future. Um, and so, like that might accelerate the flight or potential flight of customers if you know gas service were to become non-competitive with electric. Um, but it also seems like on the flip side that a warmer future um, would also mean fewer HDDs in aggregate, which would also mean less fuel consumption, so like less aggregate demand. And it seems like you're kind of stuck in a bind between those two those two extremes. So I just want to kind of like highlight, are you guys considering that like there's kind of those risks associated with both with both extremes? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and I think that's why we've t we're pulling two different scenarios um, that use, and both of them use uh, 20 different climate models. And these shared socioeconomic pathways, they, from the, the understanding that I have from ICF, the 2-4.5 and the 3-7.0 are the most likeliest scenarios they believe. Um, and so we plan on running both of those and looking at the different results. Um, but yeah, we, the, there's definitely risks rich, uh, for both of them. Um, if, you know, yeah, in a warmer, in a warmer than actual, uh, we may end up under planning some of the stuff. Um, so that's definitely a concern. And then a colder than normal, or colder than actual, uh, we may end up over planning for the carbon compliance and costs. Um, I think one of the important things to remember about these IRPs is, yes, they are 20, 26 year plans, but they are looked at every two years and reran every two years and updated every two years um, in order to reduce that long-term risk on mm -hmm. um, some of these things. So I think that's important to, to remember, especially with a lot of this stuff. Yeah. There's um, a lot, yeah. Another kind of concern that staff has is um, we're trying to make sure that there's kind of general alignment in the way that the various utilities are assessing climate change. Um, and so in our in the last IRP, we recommended that you guys run a uh, RCP 8.5 in order to align with the Northwest uh, Power and Conservation Council. Um, would you guys be willing to at least run a scenario that aligns with that standard? Um, so it is the. It's my understanding that RCP 8.5 is from the CMIP 5. Um, study do you know if northwest power and conservation council plans to update that or are they still planning on running rcp 8.5 because it's my understanding that the newest um the newest uh um research on that is the cmip 5 and i want to say I'll have to double check um, and I'll, I'll run this by um, ICF to see how these SSPs compare to the RCPs. Um, mm -hmm. oh, and I'll have to confirm with them if, if that's something that they can run as well. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so non-core outlook. Um, mentioned this before, non-core or transport customers 
they schedule and purchase their own gas, um, generally through a marketer to get gas to the city gate. Um, the customer then uses Cascade's distribution system to receive the gas. Um, these customers include all types of industrial customers. It can be a farm, uh, a brewery, a food manufacturer that averages 800,000 therms per month throughout the year. Um, we also serve six electric gin customers um, in Washington and one in Oregon. And those customers use approximately or projected to use approximately 602,000 therms in 2025. So transportation customers, um, we've seen a slight decrease from the previous forecast. Um, it's down to 241 customers in total uh, from uh, based on 2025 numbers, projected numbers. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, our industrial managers are working closely with uh, potential industrial customers communicating with them about the CCA impacts. Um, I think the the best way that we're going to understand how they plan on um, kind of maneuvering the CCA and the the carbon compliance costs is just uh, having that open communication. Um, it is still a little too early to determine what the impact of the CCA is going to have on the transport customers. Um, we do project that transport customers in Washington, Oregon will consume approximately 513 million therms in 2025. Are there any questions on the transport customers? And just a reminder that we do have, we do um, plan for the carbon compliance for some of these, um, but not all of the transport customers. Okay, and so that is the, the end of this presentation. I know that we've um, gotten a lot of feedback so far, but if anyone was holding their feedback to the end or if anyone um, has any additional feedback that they want to provide, please uh, let me know. Um, if you would rather just let me know afterwards, shoot us an email at irp at cngc.com and we will definitely get back to you. But I'll leave it open for... 30 seconds or so to see if there are any questions or any feedback. I'm not seeing any hands and I'm not seeing um, anyone in chat. So I'll move on to the remaining IRP schedule for now. Um, we're looking at running the distribution system, or sorry, the CCA compliance modeling, um, environmental policy modeling on May 7th, um, and then distribution system planning on May 16th and then resource integration on May 30th. Um, and then soon after that, we'll look at um, kicking off the. Tags um, through June from June all the way through October with different uh, draft dates and then we'll circulate the final draft December 3rd, get comments and we'll try to wrap it up by February 14th for it to be filed on February 24th. So questions and next steps. Um, review. So we're uh, looking at again. The next tag meeting will be Tuesday, May 7th. Um, and then 
contact us at irpncgc.com. If you have any any questions, any thoughts, anything like that, please let us know. Other than that, I don't have anything else. I just want to thank everyone for uh, coming today and uh, providing feedback. It's really appreciated, and um, we'll look at making some updates to the load forecast model. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Thanks Brian. Brian. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, Brian. Yeah.